In this video, we're gonna talk about linear fractional transformations and more specifically, Mobius transformations. And this is just gonna be like an introductory video on these two topics. So let's start off with a definition. If I let uh, A, B, C, and D be complex numbers, a linear fractional transformation, it's a complex function of the form f of z equals az plus b divided by cz plus d. And so a linear fractional transformation, it's literally a fraction of two linear expressions, az plus b and cz plus d. Now in the above formula that you see for f, uh, we wanna notice a few things. So the first thing that we notice is we can't plug in minus d over c because that'll give you zero in the bottom. So the domain of that function is all complex numbers except for that single complex number, you know, minus d over c. Next thing I want to notice is that uh, this linear fractional transformation, it's going to be holomorphic on its domain. So for all complex numbers except for, in this case, say minus d over c. And I'm assuming that c is non-zero, so I can divide by it just in case you're wondering. And uh, how do I know that? Well, I know because az plus b and cz plus d individually, right? They're both entire functions. Remember entire meant that it's holomorphic everywhere. Um, and uh, here's what I wanna show you. For the quotient rule, I can take the derivative of this function and uh, just to remind you how the quotient rule goes, maybe it's been a bit or maybe you're watching this and you're, you're just kinda getting used to it. It's the same one from calc one though. So I assume if you're watching this, you've had calc one. <laughs> anyway, so how do I think about this? Uh, here's my formula, and I'm gonna call the denominator low and the numerator high. So I always remember the quotient rule as low, derivative of the high, so low d high, minus high d low, divided by low squared. Some people hate that, so if I've offended you, I'm sorry. Anyway, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna distribute, and so when I distribute the a and the c through the respective parentheses, you might notice we get some like terms that combine and this reduces to AD minus BC divided by CZ plus D quantity squared. All right, so we're gonna come back to that later on. So don't forget about that. I'm not just doing that for no reason. <laughs> All right, but the next thing that I wanna tell you about for right now is that the linear functional transformation, linear fractional transformation, that's what I'm using LFT for, um, it can be associated to a matrix and uh, where you take the coefficients A, B, C, and D and you make a two by two matrix out of it. Now be careful, okay, I'm not saying I'm not saying that M represents this linear fractional transformation in like the same way that a matrix represents a linear transformation in linear algebra. So in other words, I'm not saying that this linear fractional transformation reduces to like multiplication by a matrix. They're not the same thing. So associated is kind of a loose word here. So again, I'm not saying M represents F in the linear algebra way. Again, since f itself isn't necessarily an actual linear function, so it's not necessarily represented by a matrix. So in other words, again, f is not necessarily just multiplication by this matrix a, b, c, d. All we're doing is we're just saying, look, that matrix there with these coefficients a, b, c, d, it's associated to this particular linear fractional transformation. Now another thing to say, there's a little bit more detail about this. The, there could be more than one matrix, m, that uh, is associated to the same linear fractional transformation. So like, I'm not saying there's like a one-to-one -one correspondence. If anything, there's a, there's a sur surjection from the set of you know, these matrices, A, B, C, D, uh, onto the set of linear fractional transformations. In other words, there's you know, essentially sort of more matrices than there are linear fractional transformations, if that makes any sense. Okay, so again, we're not gonna use a matrix to try to say that it, you know, reduces how you can compute uh, a linear fractional transformation via matrix multiplication. All right, I've said enough about the red. So, okay, if I'm not gonna use M to compute anything, then why am I telling you about M? And the reason I'm introducing M is because it helps me see when is a linear fractional transformation invertible. In other words, just when does it have an inverse? So here's the theorem. The linear fractional transformation, F of Z, which is AZ plus B over CZ plus D, that has an inverse, in other words, is invertible, uh, if and only if AD minus BC is non-zero. In other words, the matrix M that I've introduced, who has uh, coefficients, you know, A, B, C, D, maybe entries is a better word than coefficients. Anyway, I'm saying that that matrix is invertible. So your linear fractional transformation is invertible if and only if the matrix it's associated to is invertible. All right, so let me try to give you a proof of this. And so I'm gonna do, so we've got an if and only if, and again, I'm trying to talk you through some basic proof next techniques too. 
So I've got an if and only if. I'm going to prove the forward direction, and I'm going to do the forward direction by contrapositive. So I'm going to suppose that AD minus BC is zero. In other words, AD equals BC. And so what does that mean? Well, that means when I look at my matrix M, A, B, C, D, that means that it's singular, right? If the determinant is zero, which is, of course, what AD minus BC is, that's the determinant of that matrix, uh, then that means that uh, this matrix is not invertible. Remember, singular was another word for that. And remember, there's all sorts of things that uh, are equivalent to saying that a matrix is singular or a matrix is not invertible. And what that tells me is that the columns of the matrix are linearly dependent. And when you just have two things that are linearly dependent, that just says one is a constant multiple of the other. And so that means that the first column, AC, is some constant k times, which is complex constant, by the way, some complex constant k times the second column, uh, BD. And if you think about what that says as far as the entries are concerned, well, that says A is equal to K times B and C is equal to K times D. And now what we're going to do is we're going to plug that information into our formula for F. So I've got AZ plus B over CZ plus D is the original formula. Let's substitute in for A. Let's put a KB there. And for C, we'll put our KD there. Now what you might notice is that, uh, well, you could factor a B out of the top and a D out of the bottom. So I'm going to pull BD off of this fraction, and what I have left is KZ plus 1 over KZ plus 1. So this just reduces to B over D. And if you think about what this says from left to right, that says that in this case, if AD equals BC, then my linear fractional transformation is a constant. It's always going to have the output B over D. And I know that a constant function, it's not invertible. And so that proves the contrapositive. Uh, great. So we got, uh, you know, not, not P in this case. Now it's an if and only if. We've got to go the other direction. So let's suppose that AD minus BC actually is non-zero. So what we're going to do is just kind of a college algebra approach. If, uh, if you scroll back up to the blue, you know, I'm going to try to show you that with the hypothesis that I could find the inverse of that formula AZ plus B over CZ plus D. And uh, what I'm going to do, like I said, is just really a college algebra kind of approach. I'm going to set Z equal to AW plus B over CW plus D and solve for W. Kind of like when you've got your formula for F, you just switch where like X and Y go, if you remember doing that kind of thing, and try to solve back for Y. That's really all I'm going to do here. And uh, here's some notes, though. Of course, when I think about this formula, I'm assuming that the denominator, CW, is not the same thing as minus D. In other words, that the denominator is not just zero at the get-go, and that I'm not allowed to plug in uh, um, you know, minus D over C for W, if you like. And another thing, though, I'm guaranteed that the denominator is not identically zero, because I know that C and D can't be zero simultaneously. And the reason I know that is because AD is not equal to BC. Right? If uh, C and D were both zero, then this says zero is not equal to zero. And of course, that's silly. Of course it is. Okay, so what we're going to do, like I said, is we're going to take our equation and solve for W. So of course, you'd multiply the CW plus D over to the left side. And what we're going to try to do is um, get the things with W on the same side. So what I've done in this line is just moved AW to the left. And then I'm trying to get the stuff without a W over to the other side. So I booted ZD over to the right side by subtracting. On the left side, we'll pull that W off, and you get ZZ, ZC, sorry, minus A, is equal to the right side still. And then we'll just divide by CZ minus A. And of course, when I divide by that, I'm assuming CZ is not the same thing as A. All right, so if I think about this expression that I get for W, all right, so I got to make sure that, uh, that we're not, we don't have CZ equal to A. So like that's going to affect, you know, the domain of this function, saying Z is not allowed to be A over C. But then what else do I know here? How do I know this W is a complex number? How do I know it's not some indeterminate thing like infinity over infinity or zero over zero? Um, yeah, I really just meant to say zero over zero. <laughs> anyway, again, this is where our hypothesis that AD minus BC is non-zero comes to the rescue. So that hypothesis ensures, well, the denominator, A and C, they can't be zero at the same time because otherwise AD equals BC, and that's no good. That's a zero equals zero. But then also in the top, if AD is not equal to BC, well then B and D can't be zero at the same time either. So like I don't have some kind of an indeterminate zero over zero here. I have that this W should be a good old complex number. And that's fantastic because that shows that uh, that would be the formula for the inverse uh, of my function F. It's just going to be minus dz plus b over cz minus a. So that finishes the proof that uh, this 
linear fractional transformation has an inverse. All right, so what that leads me to now is the following definition. We're going to say a Mobius transformation is a linear fractional transformation, AZ plus B over CZ plus D, that satisfies this extra condition, AD minus BC is non-zero. All right, so these are just some kind of special LFTs, some kind of special linear fractional transformations. And if I think about this definition and I think about it through the lens of the theorem that we just proved, the previous theorem tells me that the Mobius transformations are precisely the invertible linear tr fractional transformations. So those are the invertible linear fractional transformations. And let's look at uh, one more thing. We calculated the derivative of a linear fractional transformation earlier, and you might remember, oh, it was AD minus BC over CZ plus D quantity squared. And now I've highlighted that AD minus BC because uh, if I've got a Mobius transformation, then I know that's non-zero. But wait a minute, that means that this fraction is going to be non-zero for all values in its domain. And so that's true, right? This is true that the derivative of a Mobius transformation would never, ever be zero. All right, so what does this say? This says a Mobius transformation, it's holomorphic on its domain, and of course, it has a non-zero derivative throughout its domain. So I've just said the same thing kind of two or three different ways. But uh, why am I highlighting that in pink? You might remember if you watched the previous video that that criteria that I've highlighted in pink, being holomorphic on its domain and having a non-vanishing derivative at all points in its domain, um, well, or, or just, just having a non-vanishing derivative at a point you're interested in, that was a criteria that ensured that your function was a conformal map at that particular point. And remember, conformal meant that it preserves angles. So we'll finish this video just by recouping uh, this, or kind of discovering uh, together this idea that a Mobius transformation is going to be a conformal map uh, for all points in its domain.